Hello folks, welcome back. Pastor Bob from Place of Refuge. Today, my message is called Things to Avoid. We're going to be in James chapter 4, the first 10 verses. So thanks for coming again. Here we go. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your, your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lust, lusteth to envy? And he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw close to you, or draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and weep your laughter. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness, and humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Wow, there's some good things. To avoid so you know there's there's things in here that happen in churches you know that there's some problems but also there were some uh, teachers that I was looking in some of the former works of some of the people in the 1800s they think possibly there might have even been wars and fightings physically and killings and stuff but at any rate um, it applies here to us because you know if we think we have hatred in the heart we're basically a murder and stuff so Let's go. And so, so from whence come wars? Or where they come, these wars? Now, wars here, it can be... Now, let's just look on a spiritual level here. It's a dispute or a fight, a battle, strife, and a quarrel. You ever had quarrels with anybody at church and stuff? Not fun, is it? God tells us how to do, deal with them in Matthew 18, Galatians 6, 1. But we do have quarrels sometimes, unfortunately. But remember, our brothers and sisters, you always give them the benefit of the doubt, and you guys... And love and work with one another. So you got wars and fighting. That's a combat. It's it's persons at variance is what it means in the Greek. Uh, there can you can be a disputant and it causes strife, contention, and a quarrel. And um, <clears throat> even in your own lust, it says in your own lust. Now, this one here, you've been with me for a while. Usually, lust here means desire for what is forbidden. Now, it's almost identical, but it is a different Greek word. It says, desires for pleasure, to have sensual pleasure and gratification. What do these lusts do? They war in our members. How many know that's true? War here is fight, wage war. It's, it also means in this war, desires and lusts, which war against what? The principles and the moral precepts of God. That's what it does. In your members. Now, the members here is the men, members of the body of Christ, or, but it also means a seat in our desires and passions. So we, it's a metaphoric term when it talks about the members of Christ, and the body of Christ, rather. So then verse 2. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war and have not. Why? Because you ask not. <clears throat> All right, and then it clarifies how you ask here in the next one. So you lust. Again, this one is a different one as well, but it's almost like all the other ones. It means you covet, you want to covet, you long for, or you lust after, uh, of those who seek things forbidden. So you lust and have not, and you kill. You slay and murder, kill a man unjustly, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight. And so here we have again the armed combatants, if you will, of those who are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand struggle. And those who engage in a war of words or a quarrel, which is a lot of times that can happen in the church. Wrangling and dispute, even those who contend at law for property or privileges. You know, it's hard to go into it. Hopefully, you know, it's hard when Christians have disputes, especially if it's a legal or financial thing. It's hard. You know, turn it over to the Lord. He'll give you wisdom. Amen. But then it says you war because you ask not, you call, or you don't crave, excuse me, you carry on war to fight, yet you have not. Why? Because you ask not or call for or crave or desire. You know, what I do is when I have problems, and it's not like I've got a pat answer for all this, 
But I had an issue here just a few days ago. And, you know, rather than, you know, combating or what, I just prayed about it. And God worked it all out. No foul. It worked out great. So verse 3, it depends on how you ask, too. And it says, you ask and receive not. Why? Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of times we want mercy for ourselves and condemnation for those that take us off. You know, you got to protect your heart in this. Amiss means it's improperly. It means wrongly or miserable. It actually does say miserable. <laughs> that you may com consume it on your own lust or you want your own ways. And this one, it means desire for pleasure again, sensual pleasure. And it's only used of physical pleasure here in the Greek in this particular time. All right. Then he emphasizes in verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. <clears throat> Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now, adulterers, you know, you guys know what that is. It's one who is faithless towards God or ungodly. Now, that's what it said here, adulterers. It really didn't even have something to do with you know, like an adulterer affair with a woman, but this is one who is faithless towards God. Amen. And adulteress is here as the uh, the intimate alliance of God with people of Israel. You know how when when Israel was his people, and still are, I may submit, um, it was likened unto them when they committed adultery, or excuse me, idolatry, it was like adultery, like, you know, a, a man and a woman. So it was to play the harlot, faithless to God, and it was actually an unclean apostate as well. So we have adulterers, and those are the ones that are faithless towards God, and the ungodly. And then here are the adulteresses, faithless to God, unclean apostate, to play the harlot. Now, friendship of the world. All right, so friendship here means you're fond or befriend. And I'll clarify a little bit here. Let me tell you what it means. It involves the, the adopting of the interests of the world to be one's own. All right, how many know, and if you've been a Christian for a while, you know this term. It's good, we are in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. And I know if you've been a Christian a while, you get that. So what is the world here? It's the word cosmos. And, and this means it's the things that seduce us from God and are obstacles to what? The cause of Christ. That's what this means. The ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men or women alienated from God and hostile to the cause of Christ. Remember that. It's like the hostiles. You guys know a lot of the things, I don't know, in your state, um, we're going to be voting on proposals that are very anti-Christ. I would encourage you to look and see what they say, because you'll find that it doesn't mirror up with the Lord. Amen? And if you're in another country, I know some of you are, still, look at what you have to do and stuff, and stay away from those things that are evil. These are things that are harm, um, that are harmful. But now, what are not harmful? You know what? I like a nice day just like the next one. I like a sunset and a sunrise. I love the mountains and rivers and oceans and stuff. That, there's nothing wrong with that, enjoying what God has created. However, the system in our world is not good. You know, if you live in the United States, you can see our country on a decline. It's never been this bad, and it's progressively getting worse. So we don't want to be... If we're a friend or an associate or a companion, that's what it means here. Again, it's the system of ungodliness. It's not like, you know, I, you know, he wants you to be bummed out. That's not it. It's it, We don't want to be a friendship of the things that are hostile to the Lord. Amen? So if we're a friend of the world, we're going to be an enemy of God or because of all those things. An enemy means hateful, odious, a man that is hostile. Again, what is that? adversaries of the Messiah. That's what it means. The devil who's the most bitter enemy of divine government. And you know, he hates anything proper. He hates it, you know, and he works overtime to corrupt our system. He does. All right, then it says in verse five, you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lust and envy. Well, lust means to lust or harbor. And it does mean forbidden desire, desires earnestly long for, to envy. You know, vain or vainly, um, which is empty and no purpose. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? No, it doesn't. The spirit that dwelt in us is envy? No, no. But he gives grace. 
Therefore, or wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> How many know that's a good one? But he said, he giveth more grace. More means greater and larger and stronger. More what? More grace. Okay, the word is charis or charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, that which affords joy and pleasure and delight and sweetness and charm, goodwill, loving kindness, favor. And then here it is. I love this. The merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence on who? On souls. That's you and I. God resists the proud. Now, how would you like God to resist? <laughs> Let me tell you how, how strong that word is. It means to range and battle against, to oppose oneself. You know the scripture in Proverbs where it said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's true. But he, God resists the proud. Okay? What's the proud here? Showing oneself above others? Overtopping people, if you will? Despising others or even treating them with contempt or haughtiness? Amen? But he gives grace. And now that word is the same thing about more grace earlier. Unto who? The humble. Those are the ones that are not high and they're modest and they have piety towards God. Amen. And that's what's used here. Now, verse 7, <clears throat> it's interesting. When I was starting this message, I actually started in verse 7. And then the Lord said, well, you need to go back and go why that this is in here. And I, and I said, and of course, I submitted to him. I said, yeah, you're right. So I had like four pages of notes. And I thought, no, I want to go back what? what was listed in James 1 through 6 before I go to here. But I love this scripture. Verse 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee you. All right? Submit yourself means to arrange. We need to arrange ourselves under the gospel and the things of God. It's submit to one's control, who's that God, and to yield to one's admonition or advice or obey. What is that? That's God's word and what he has written in there he wants us to submit to. And it, we're going to do submit to that, therefore, to God when we do that. It means submitting to God is the first step. How many know that's the first step? Submit yourself, therefore, to God first. That's, a cut, and, that's cut and dry. Okay? One brother said this to God. It says, continue to bow all decisions into all his dis dispensations. I agree with that. So we need to submit to everything. So let us let us all yield to God's admonition and his advice and keep his word. Resist the devil. You know, I imagine that you all have things that you have to work on. We all do. Resist means to set oneself against, whether in deed or word. Whether in deed or word. Is it a deed that you have to work on, or is it word you have to work on? Or both. Okay, we need to resist the devil. Now, the devil here is Diabolus, and it's one who falsely accuses and divides people, get this, without any reason, prone to slander and slanderous. Okay, the devil will come to you to either steal, kill, or destroy. And may I submit, he, when he comes, he's going to do one of those three things. So when you're dealing with that, know it's him that's prodding you. Amen? You're in a heated discussion. You know, the Bible teaches where many words are spoken, sin abounds. A lot of you get in a heated conversation, and you're going at each other, and he's in there. He's rooting you on. Why? Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy your relationship with who you're arguing with. That's how he does it. So resist the devil. Those are the, He's the one that accuses and divides people without any reason. He's prone to slander and slanders. And he, if you do that, he will flee you. It, you know, a lot of people don't put the you in there, and he will flee. No, he'll flee you if you resist him. It means to escape and run away from and flee and vanish. Now, that's a pretty good deal. Let me give you a side scripture here. This is 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Why? Be vigilant. How come? Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who he may what? Bless? No. The devourer. That means to drink down, swallow down, and destroy. Remember what I said. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Resist him. Amen. And it's hard to do it sometimes, especially when you're in a heated situation. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Hallelujah. Verse 8. Now here's the great 
One of the greatest scriptures in here, draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to you. What a deal. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. All right, let's talk about drawing. Draw nigh means, obviously, means to come near. It means to approach. Now, you know what this is, my friends, for those of you who are really big in English, and I'm by no, no stretch a, an English major by anything, but uh, it's, this is a verb. What's that mean? It has to show action, okay? Approach, come near, or draw nigh to God. So you and I do that, and God will draw close to us. Now that, my friends, is the biggest, one of the biggest deals in the Bible. You know, outside of salvation, you draw close to him, he's going to draw close to you. Cleanse your hand or make clean. Cleanse means to be free from defilement of sin and from faults. Means to consecrate and dedicate your hands. Now when it says hands, it's a lot like your walk. It's, it's like, a, it's a figurative. It's our activity, our power. Um, everything controlling the destinations of man. All right, that's our hands, what we do with our hands and stuff. Amen? Purify your hearts. Now, that word purify means cleanse morally, consecrate, there's a good word, render pure in a moral sense, and what? To reform. Who and what? Your hearts. You know, that word hearts, here's cardia, and it is with a K. Most of the ones in the medical terms start with a C, but it's a K. God knows what he's doing. Purify our will. Our characters, our affections, our purposes, our endeavors, our understanding, and our passions. Now, double-minded here, it says, ye double-minded. Now, I'm going to give you a really good interpretation of double-mindedness. Now, this come right out of the Strong's in my Hebrew, or excuse me, not Hebrew, but my Greek word study dictionary. Okay, so I wrote it down because it's powerful. <clears throat> excuse me. Here it is. Double-minded means wavering, uncertain, doubting, divided in interest, and, and an unstable person. Now, that's bad enough. Now, get this. Now, here, this is where the word dictionary come in, and it really gave it and brought it home. Because, you know, you're double-minded. How do you know if you're double-minded? Well, if it'll, it'll mirror what I'm just saying here. Now, get this. Such a person suffers from divided loyalties. On one hand, he wishes or she maintain a religious confession and desires the presence of God in his or her life. On the other hand, he loves the ways of the world and prefers to live according to its mores and ethics. That's exactly what it said. This is not my opinion. So we don't want to be double-minded. That's not good, you know. So James was dealing with a lot of things in the preceding verses. That's why I started back at verse 1, okay. This this verse here encourages them to kind of feel remorse what you see what right on. Now, I want to say this. He doesn't want you to walk and be bummed out all the time. No, he wants us to be remorseful of our sins and the things that we do are not good. So that's when it comes in verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now, God doesn't want you to walk around with a big gloom over your head. But the thing is, is we need to be remorseful if we are doing things wrong. You know, there's a problem if we sin, and, and it's no big deal. We need to protect God's heart. It is a big deal. First John 1, 9, confess your sin, and he's what? Faithful and just to forgive you of all your unrighteousness? That, my friend, he will forgive you. Do that. All right, so it says, let's go back to verse 9. Afflicted means to, to toil heavily, to endure labors and hardships. And metaphorically, it means to endure affliction. Okay? Sometimes you might have to. You know, you got to bite the bullet sometimes. And mourn. In other words, be sad, but here's a good word, lament and be sorrowful. It's used in other scriptures as bewailing and wailing itself, all right? Weep. It means, again, lament and mourn, weeping as a sign of pain and grief. Let your laughter, it's particularly your joy and triumph, turned into mourning or sadness, and your joy, to, <laughs> and your joy or gladness to heaviness, to be downcast, look expressive of sorrow, be expressive of sorrow. Now, and again, I want you to understand, this is not like God wants you to walk around with a cloud over your head. No, 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 no. However, but we need to mourn. Does it break your heart when some of the stuff that's going on in our country right now, that people are, you know, they're, they're trying to encourage all this promiscuous behavior and all this evil stuff? I mourn when I hear that. Do I have happy days? Of course. But the problem is, you know, when, when, when evil is pre prevailing, I mourn and I lament. But you know what? I resort to prayer, and it works. 
Now, I like this. How many of you guys know what a, a shotgun, a 410 shotgun is? You know what a 410 shotgun is? Most of you guys probably do, and a lot of you women that hunt. 410s. They're kind of a smaller, smaller caliber uh, shotgun. But I want you to think about this. James 410. Amen? And this is what it says. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, or the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, there's a good 410. Amen? I do that word association with my church a lot. Think about it. A shotgun 410. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and what will happen, my friends? He will lift you up. All right, humble means to bring low with the idea of contrition. And again, we're talking about that, you know, about the sinful. And penitence toward God. Sorrow for sins or faults. Listen, God doesn't want you to walk around, but like I said, you confess. But it means also this. It means to bring down one's pride, to behave in an unassuming manner, devoid of all haughtiness. How do we do that? In the sight, in the presence of the Lord. Amen? And he shall do what? He will lift you up to exalt and raise to dignity, honor and happiness, and generally to raise to a condition of prosperity, dignity, and honor. You can see it all through the Old Testament and the New. God does not like proud people. Amen? Ones that are haughty. You know, if you know, he wants us to be happy. But you know what I'm saying? There's a difference. Don't be haughty. Let me give you some more side scriptures here. This is Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet has he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. That's Psalm 138, 6. The lowly here, guess what it means? Humble of condition or spirit. That's what God wants us to be, humble. We shouldn't be arrogant people. Amen? Luke 14, 11. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, the word humble here, believe it or not, it's the same Greek word as James 4.10. Remember that shotgun, 4.10. To make low, bring low with the ideal of idea of contrition and penitence toward God. Sorrow for sins and faults. Now, if you remember the title of the message, it was Things to Avoid. And this chapter is really good. But if there's something that you can take, care, take away with it, remember... Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. And if you humble yourselves in the sight of God, or the Lord here, he shall lift you up. And if you did a little more word study, there's plenty more on that. All right, well, I hope this blessed you. You know, let's pray. Father, these are things that we need to avoid. Let us humble ourselves in the sight of God, because why, Lord, we want you to lift us up. And so, Father, I pray a blessing on this message. And a blessing on these folks. I thank you for the time that they spent just listening to me. I'm nobody, Lord, but your word is everything. So God bless each and every one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and your glory. God bless you, my friends. Lord willing, I'll see you next week. Take care.